Welcome back. Uh, uh, it's the age of money. I mean, money, 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 money. You know, Ben Franklin once said that money is prolific in generating money. Money can beget money, and its offspring can beget more. Well, I got to tell you, with all due respect to Ben Franklin, he had no clue how prolific money could be because right now, the ingenious Wall Street ways, uh, let's just put it this way, they have perverted the nature of money, and now it is widely held that we've transitioned into an era called financialization. Now, according to a paper by Thomas Pauli, uh, financialization is a process by which financial markets, institutions, and elites gain greater influence over economic policy and economic outcomes. It transforms the functioning of the economic systems at both the macro and micro level. Well, we need to unpack that. So we brought in Ironside's a micro, macro uh, economics managing partner, Barry Knapp. Barry, you and I have talked about this. You are so brilliant at, at this conversation. And, and one thing that bothers me is I brought it up with economists, a lot of top economists on Wall Street, and they kind of shoo me away. I, I feel like they're circling the wagons and protecting the system. This, what I just read, to everyone in this audience, it's obvious to a degree that those things are happening right now. Interesting to bring the guy in from Lehman Brothers, <laughs> you know, who was, had a front row seat. He had a front row seat to it, system, yeah, yeah. Right? So, um, yeah, I mean, we could just go through the post-World War II history and, and look at the progression we decided to fix our exchange rate at a level that essentially undervalued our currency to rebuild Germany and Japan, hollowed out our... So in addition to all the other things that we did to help re be rebuild that... Correct. The, the, the architects of that, think about the Americans, American purchasing power and that kind of stuff? Uh, essentially, by the time we went off Bretton Woods in 1971, um, we had hollowed out our manufacturing sector. That was the first step towards doing it. We, of course, did that again in 2001 when we admitted China to the WTO, allowed them to grow, bring 700 million people out of mud huts, but it lost another 5 million manufacturing jobs. And we've continued a pace with goals like everyone should own a home in the early 2000s and the role of Fannie and Freddie in building that whole subprime market that, in right. essence, blew up. So we've just right. gone layer after layer of this, and now we find ourselves with this massive pile of debt, larger than the size of our economy, which we could finance, but the cost inherent in running government spending at 24% of GDP, 7% budget deficits, is inflation. And the implication for investors are... With, as long as inflation volatility is low, equities can be something of a hedge for that. But as you and I have discussed, I think the bond market is in another structural bond bear market right. like it was through right. the 50s, 60s, and right. 70s. Right. And they're not going to be nearly as good a store of wealth. I, I, so I want to go and, and back to some of the things you just mentioned. First of all, China and the WTO, to this day, they're still recognized as, a, as an emerging nation. And they get special status that, that we don't right. get, uh, which is crazy. It's nuts, right? Uh, not long ago, they were predicting that they would surpass our economy. Uh, the other parts of this, right, the housing bubble, uh, that, that with the subprime lending, uh, we know politically it was a political topic. Bill Clinton made it really political. Now we're seeing it happening again. I just saw it uh, just a couple days ago. Jenny May, record numbers of, of, uh, uh, of... Wall Street always makes money off of this, though. It feels like Main Street always gets hurt. Wall Street always makes money. In the rare times they don't make money, uh, Main Street bails them out. So... You know, it's, everyone's into money now. I mean, it's everything is money. Before you would invest in something, in a factory, in a building, in a business. Now you could just give someone on Wall Street a bunch of money, and they put it in some kind of machine, and then they give you money back in 13% interest. But you're not creating anything. Our economy doesn't create anything. I'm going to give you the last word. We've got just a minute to go, but is there something inherently worrisome about that? Uh, well, for me, this all invariably comes back to uh, government good intentions, right? Everyone should own a home. Um, we needed all this pandemic relief. We needed to, you know, make it easier for people to avoid getting this virus. And invariably, it just has these unintended consequences and gets bigger and bigger. Right. So, you know, the um, labor share of income declined through that whole Chinese uh, episode when we did allow them to grow their, their way out of poverty. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a flaw, it's flaws in the system. Right. And to be unaware of it is to be vulnerable to it. So, yeah. you know, as I said, for me, the simplest way to think about this is 
investing in the parts of our economy that are the most dynamic, least impacted by the government, technology, right? That innovation is how yeah. you're going to protect yourself. And buying government bonds, while it might seem like a store of wealth in an inflationary environment, probably won't be. My man, thank you so, All so right, much. Charles.